Good evening all, I'm Liti Lamba with the Thursday night edition of South Asian News. Welcome to Vision of Asia, voice of our community. We are coming to you from our studio in New York City. Here's what's happening tonight in the coronavirus pandemic. It's been one devastating summer across the nation with tens of thousands of Americans dead and millions of new coronavirus infections. The world has now surpassed 22.4 million cases of COVID-19 with at least 788,000 deaths. There are nearly 5.6 million cases of COVID-19 in the United States and more than 173,000 deaths. States across the South and West continue to report the most daily infections, still with states Texas, Georgia and Florida as the hotspots for coronavirus. Georgia as a state remains in a red zone for the severity of the outbreak. Georgia Department of Health is urging all residents to wear a mask, watch their distance, wash hands and follow public health guidelines. Guidelines. Texas has issued a face mask mandate. Mississippi has temporarily mandated mask wearing in public statewide. Along with that, U.S. students are returning to school in person and online in the middle of the pandemic. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has suggested communities of positivity rates below 5% to reopen schools. However, on this reopening of institutions, more than a dozen states are reporting COVID-19 cases, including Georgia, North Carolina, Mississippi, and many more. These outbreaks are being traced to off-campus gatherings, athletics, on-campus Greek life, and dorms. On this, the Michigan State University has announced that this year will start remotely for all of its undergraduate students, and the Ithaca College in New York State is also extended remote instruction through the fall semester. Here in New York City today, Bill de Blasio, the mayor, announced that the city is releasing a back-to-school pledge, detailed list of everything to reopen safely. New York City schools are scheduled to reopen on September 10th. If you are an educator, a parent, or a student going back to school, please write to us on events at itvgold.com. We want to get some perspectives here. With that, the South Asian News segment tonight covers much on the impact of coronavirus on the food industry, along with the continued dialogue on racial justice. Here are the headlines. Singer-songwriter and producer Ila Paliwal discusses Ila, the Earth Symphony and Music Journey, ITV Gold exclusive. Punjabi Chamber of Commerce hosts a webinar on restaurants and COVID annihilation and hope. Saldiv presents six-part series demystifying U.S. history and activating Sikh action for black justice featuring Kiran Corgill. A lot more on the other side of the break. Stay with us in Vision of Asia. Voice of the Community will be back shortly. Welcome again. I'm Diti Lama and this is Vision of Asia, Thursday night episode of South Asian News. Let's take a look at the Punjabi Chamber of Commerce, which continues to empower the Indian Punjabi diaspora through commerce and cooperation. The nonprofit is dedicated to offering a platform for Indian Punjabi businesses and professionals through education, networking, and advocacy. On that, the Chamber recently hosted an online session, a webinar on restaurants and COVID, annihilation, and hope, focused on the issues of restaurants nationwide due to COVID-19. Featuring a panel of experts, the event brought together popular Punjabi restauranters discussing the impact of coronavirus on the food industry as a whole and measures restaurants have had to take to stay afloat. Highlighting the philanthropic services of restaurants nationwide during COVID-19 relief, the panelists also reflected upon the need for communication, collaboration and change in the industry to truly get through the crisis. Some also discussed the opportunities COVID-19 has provided businesses through takeout and delivery services with innovative ideas and practices. The event saw celebrity chef and author Chef Manit Chauhan along with several leaders of the Indian food industry. Here's a segment of the webinar on staying afloat during the coronavirus pandemic. We are obviously in the business of food, but we are, some of us are also personalities, right? We are brands in our own selves. Manit for sure is one. Uh, Vikas Khanna, who uh, happens to be from our college, Manit, uh, he has done a, a fabulous job from an apartment in Manhattan. I met him uh, a few weeks ago when he was there. I was like, what are you doing? He's in a, in a tiny apartment in Manhattan and he's sitting there and everything doing on phone. By the one day, he mistakenly sent me a message, Kunal, 20 kilo rice, not there here. I was like, who is this? There was another Kunal he was dealing with in India, apparently. And... Uh, this is, he saw an opportunity there uh, to make his brand uh, as a philanthropist. Uh, 
I don't know if he's eyeing Padma Shri or Padma Bhushan, but that is going that way. Uh, that is uh, uh, Chef Jose Andreas. Uh, you might have heard about his uh, World Central Kitchen. He's doing a tremendous job. And I think in all, all of us in our own way have donated meals. Kamal and Rajesh, Kamal first. Uh, has, what is your, have you done anything in philanthropy wise, donation wise, which you have felt good about? Now I have time to think about charity because now I don't have much to do in catering. This was a situation where uh, part of it is you need help because um, uh, our company is huge. Like I have uh, more than 200 employees. These are full-time employees I'm talking about between all the 10 locations and the catering size and having 50% of revenue getting shot because what happens uh, the first quarter of every year because of the weather conditions in New York, New Jersey, tri-state area, anyways, it's, it's bad for catering business. Uh, even the dining business falls down. People don't want to go out. They're not that adventurous, especially like our, our Indian community. Because my clientele is all 95% we cater to our own community, Indians. Uh, people are skeptical. If they see there's going to be rain, nobody wants to go out. So given that, we were already struggling as we struggle every year. As a smart businessman, you take into account those first three months because you know you're not going to make any money. You still have rents to pay. You still have payroll to pay. So you start saving uh, from the last quarter of the previous year. We were recovering from that and end of March, boom, pandemic happened. Uh, my first and the foremost uh, objective of that uh, thing was to first of all make sure all my staff and their families are good because as much as I personally am connected to the company or my restaurants are connected to the community, I am connected to my staff. For me, those are my immediate world. And as we all know, we all are restaurants so who are not everyone uh, belongs to the same socioeconomic background. Right? There is a server or there is a dishwasher in the back or there is a a uh, uh, third helper in the kitchen whose job is just to do the cutting, chopping and all, who's barely surviving on like minimum wages, uh, does have family too. He has his own kids to go and feed. He has his own rent to pay. So a part of my charity happened within the company. That was my first step. Kamal, I'm going to and take this to Rajesh. Uh, I just got this message from Sachin Shah. He's one of our members and he also runs this uh, Black Thorn pub in New Brunswick. That's not an Indian restaurant. It happens to be run by an Indian. It's a pub. We, most of us know that. Uh, he's saying during these tough times, 30% of the restaurants might be wiped out. That's also an opportunity for others, 70%. It's a malicious way of looking at it, I guess. But then that is the reality. I live in New Jersey, so I'm in the suburbs. So when this... Uh, a thing has happened, work from home. So all the people who are in the city have moved out of the city and gone back to the respective states or areas where they were, you know, and they're not coming out, so they're working at home. So all the neighborhood places which have opened outside, I'm saying New York, are doing expectantly well, and they're actually doing better numbers. I asked few of them, and they were doing better numbers now after the pandemic than they were doing before. So that's an opportunity for them, right? Uh, yeah. Because all the people who are not there are now uh, centralized there. Density has increased and people are not going to the city as much. Uh, they're they there. I mean, I've been uh, talking to some of the uh, big tenants like, you know, uh, Tishpin Spires. They wanted to take a location and they're telling me and they are telling me themselves. The rocks, for example, Rock Center is at 12 percent occupancy. And after September, they expect it to only go up by 10 percent. Now, imagine. If 25% occupancy is there, how are you going to have the footfall which people are so used to in New York? I mean, that's why you see all the big time Thomas Keller has closed. Today I was reading uh, Arc Restaurant, which have 20 restaurants, big, uh, big ticket. They have this uh, Bryant Park uh, Grill and Cafe. It does about 28 million a year, $80,000 a day sales, approximately is down to 10,000. But they can only do use the patio. And he's, he's he, out of his five operations, three is shut, two are open. And he's today said absolutely that I am not even thinking of opening any more restaurant in New York City because the opportunity lies outside. Where mm -hmm. Now my numbers in Florida, where the pandemic is even worse than New York, which is controlled. He says the numbers in Florida are much better than what I do in New York with much lesser cost of operations. So unless New York City, something does dramatically, you know, to help people. Like landlords have not budged that much, maybe giving two months here, three months here, or 50%. I don't think that's going to be enough uh, to sustain on a, on, a, on a longer run, you know. So that's 
the biggest problem of New York City. Food and design innovation. Keeping businesses aside, do you think these are breeding grounds for innovation? We'll start with Manith, of course. Manith. Absolutely. I think um, you know, uh, desperation calls for the most uh, innovative of all solutions, and we've always seen that over the years. Um, at times, some of these things go overboard. Uh, to me, especially that photograph <laughs> like that of the right people. Side. Yes, I'm like, <laughs> come on. <laughs> Who would want to go out and dine that way, right? Um, but it has. Um, it, it has um, had people start thinking on a lot of different uh, levels, right? And the most interesting part is that each and every person contributes, right? It's interesting, like um, the, the examples which I can give you the best is what we are doing because we are so that's what's happening in front of me starting right from the kitchens where the entire kitchen is working on menus on how to increase the uh, you know the cover per person like how would people be inspired to spend more money when they come in because let's face it not everybody is comfortable coming out right they are we are having people coming in but right now we are operating at 50 percent occupancy right and that is the mandate and it closes at 10 o'clock means we know that we have to stop seating people at 8 30 so we have got a smaller window to serve people um so that is absolutely i mean you know Innovation is even how we are, how we've set up the entire restaurant to serve people so that there is six feet, you know, uh, in between. And again, I keep on coming back to the fact that in uh, Nashville, we do have the luxury of space. I, I mean, if I was in New York, I don't know how innovation, I mean, maybe you needed those upside down, uh, over, overly crazy champagne, uh, you know, <laughs> upside down champagne glasses to, uh, to keep apart. But the one thing in terms of innovation, what we've done, which has been really interesting is I used to be out traveling all the time, you know, giving demos and doing cooking classes and stuff. What we've started doing is now we've started, um, we go ahead and ship those kits to people and um, I get on to Zoom um, with somebody who knows technology a little bit better than me and we just go ahead and do the cooking class together and in the end of the day people are cooking they are doing something because what people are missing the most is the experience uh, is uh, you know experience of anything be it cooking be it sewing or anything and that's something that we have offered so I do think that in terms of innovation that has been a fun thing that we've come up with now we have another segment of our conversation featuring SALDEF, the Sikh American Legal Defense and Education Fund, a national Sikh American media policy and education organization, which is dedicated to empowering the Sikh American community by building dialogue, promoting civic and political participation, along with social and religious justice. With that, SALDEF is organizing a virtual 2020 racial justice series titled Demystifying U.S. History and Activating Sikh Action for the Black Justice Movement. Just like the name suggests, the series brings forth understanding and knowledge on the ongoing Black Lives Matter movement for racial justice and equality and the solidarity of the Sikh American community in standing with the Black American community. We spoke with Executive Director of SALDEF, Kiran Corgill, on the ongoing series and the impact or solution on the ongoing unrest seen through protests and demonstrations since the death of George Floyd. Kiran also highlighted the increase in hate crimes against Sikh Americans and the importance of reporting the incidents. Here is Kiran Corgill. You know, we were discussing racism and discrimination and also racial justice and the importance of equality. Recently, we have heard some incidents of hate crimes against Sikh Americans, even during the pandemic. I wanted to see if you can provide some information to us and also maybe a word out to people on making sure they report if there is a hate crime or discrimination done against them due to their identity. I would love for you to just address that, if you could. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's incredibly important um, for if you are a victim of a hate crime to report. The F FBI does keep statistics on hate crime, um, and that certainly influences, it, you know, government policy. It influences how much, um, you know, attention this issue gets. And, and what we're hoping for is, is stronger hate crime laws federally and, and in states. So um, please do report. You can report through SALDEF. Um, you can report directly to the FBI, report to um, state and local law enforcement. 
Um, it's an incredibly important issue. I know for the Sikh community, we've seen a dramatic rise um, in the number of hate crimes from the last time the FBI released their statistics um, until the most recent release. Um, so it, it's unfortunately an issue that we have to contend with. But if we don't know the scale of the issue um, and we don't, it's not highlighted, we're not, we don't have the data to highlight it, mm -hmm. then it's hard to elevate it through policies. And so, again, if, if you are a victim of a hate crime or you know someone, I strongly encourage uh, you to report. And certainly you can re report through SALDEF. We are in touch with FBI and state and local law enforcement. Yeah, and I think it's so important to highlight the fact, and I hope everyone watching us can understand that they have the right to report if something wrong is being done. And there are platforms such as SALDEF that are working tirelessly to just get those voices heard. You know, we are coming towards the close of this interview, but I just wanted to ask you, what is your focus with SALDEF for the next two to three months? What can we look forward to? And um, personally, what are you focused on with the organization? Sure, absolutely. So I do want to say this is a six-part series, racial justice series. So um, our next uh, um, our next episode, if you will, for this series is this Sunday, August 23rd at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And you can get more information on our website, www.saldef.org. Um, and so that, that series will go August through September. Um, we are also working on the sick vote so encouraging our people um our community and um sick south asians uh, and the broader community to vote in this election because it's incredibly important and a lot of these issues we're talking about in this, this series um can only get addressed if you have the right policies and you have people in leadership positions that care about these issues so um, that is another initiative of solda and then um we also completed in um, early August, a national sick survey. So that will be the results of that survey and the report will be coming out in, um, in a couple months as well. So we are actively working on that. Um, so those are a couple of our major initiatives right now. It's going to be a busy couple months, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure for everybody, but it's going to be a certainly, um, an important couple months that can, you know, shape the direction of this country. Of course, so and we I will think, be working on that. Yeah, and I think voting is so important, and I think it's so incredible that you are focused on that. And also, we look forward to the SICK survey. I know there's a lot that's going to be written on it for the SICK American community, about the SICK American community. I know you're trying to bring a lot of data in, so we look forward to that. Kiran, thank you so much for your time on ITV Gold. I truly appreciate it. Thank you. It's time for the short break on Vision of Asia, Voice of the Community. We'll be back shortly. Welcome back. This is Vision of Asia, the South Asian news segment, and I am Aditi Lamba. We have now another segment of our exclusive conversation featuring award-winning vocalist, producer, and songwriter Ila Paliwal on her newly released album titled Ila, the Earth Symphony. The album pays homage to Mother Nature, its creations, and highlights climate change and its preservation. Ela the Earth Symphony features a collaborative effort between international artists with an ensemble of 150 leading musicians from around the world coming together for the nine-track record comprising of languages, Sanskrit and Hindi, offering layers of Indian and Western musical orchestration. Ila Paliwal spoke wholeheartedly on bringing together the album composed by Grammy Award winner Ricky Cage along with a take on her beautiful journey of music and collaborations with music legends such as A.R. Rahman and many more. Do check out the album Ila the Earth Symphony streaming on all platforms. Here is Ila Paliwal. Ila, is it hard being a South Asian American artist um, in this country right now in the music world? What is your opinion on that? I, I think it's it's getting better. Hmm. It has been hard, but I think it it is getting better, especially if you are living on either coast, uh, because the people are very international. I have to tell you, I got uh, mail from one of um, my Jewish friend who's a lawyer who doesn't understand any Hindi, any Sanskrit, and he listened to my album and he gave me names of each song. 
Shiva, Sadeem, or one more song, I forget which one he said. And he explained to me, he said, I didn't understand, but they touched me. And I played it to my Jewish, other Jewish friends, and they're all going to go and uh, download your album. So I think, I think we have come a long way, mm. and we can see Indian music being presented in uh, beautiful venues like Carnegie Hall, Lincoln Center, yeah. um, instead of just home basements and or in like small gatherings. So um, I feel it's getting better and it is it has a great future. Wow, and I love that positive attitude towards it. You know, it's so important for us to like explore that and always keep in motivating our own community with it. Ila, where do you see yourself in the next five to ten years? Where is your music journey taking you according to you? Well, I do have lots of ideas that I want to uh, produce in, 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 in the form of music. I am working on my uh, next project and uh, that also deals with human emotion. I always like to find um, topics which connect with people and, um, uh, and uh, you know, draw the, the inspiration from the ancient scriptures in, in Indian subcontinent or, or anywhere in the world, basically. But I like to do that. So uh, I don't know what the future will hold. But uh, for me, music is my life and I would continue to do that. So are there, any, uh, are there any projects that are just in the pipeline that we can know about? Well, it's a little too soon right <laughs> now. I'm just focusing on the virtual concert that's coming in September, but yeah. hopefully in a few months I will have some uh, more details. Yeah, What's But I have written the lyrics yes. and uh, started composing some of the songs, so it's all working. Yeah. We are coming towards an end of this interview, but I would love to ask you about this virtual concert that's happening in September. What can we know? What can the audience look forward to? And what are you trying to like celebrate through that? I was all set to launch the album uh, at the Kennedy Center on August 15th, uh, but due to COVID, uh, we had to cancel that plan and we decided to do a virtual concert. So uh, we are planning to stream it um, on multiple platforms uh, sometime mid-September or third week of September. Please be on lookout for it. Um, if we have all the artists who have performed on the album and even more artists from South Africa, the Soweto Gospel Choir, um, uh, then we have the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, we have artists from Australia uh, and uh, from uh, New York, Miami, uh, different kind of artists, about 30 or 40 people performing live and uh, I will be doing the whole album. And uh, we have even used some uh, uh, visual artists like sand artists and speed painters and puppeteers and things like that. So it's going to be a beautiful, beautiful concert. And I'm very excited. It's come out beautiful. Wow. Um, so please watch. <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds massive and it sounds so exciting. I feel like you're going to have a festival virtually pretty much. Um, thank you so much for being with us on ITV Gold, Ela. I would love for you to give one last message to our audience, perhaps on your album. Yeah, so thank you so much for having me, first of all. Um, and uh, for the audience, just uh, just please take care of your mental health, your uh, physical health, and listen to the album. Please be more, um, uh, you know, a conscious consumer and uh, just enjoy the nature more and um, respect our mother earth. And this is all for tonight's show. Remember to send us your suggestions and get your voices and organizations on our show. Email us on events at itvgold.com or follow us on Facebook at itvgold. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch many of our popular shows for free. Thank you for joining us tonight from Queens, New York. This is Vision of Asia and I am Aditi Lamba. Take care and be well.